the body is so amazing and there's so many different things going on. So not only is your body repairing, spell checking DNA mistakes and doing processes to, you know, prevent angiogenesis to cancer cells, for example, and, you know, defending your body against novel viruses and the list goes on and on. Um, it's all of these multifaceted roles, but in this role specifically, I would imagine that somebody with the, with the severe COVID infection, for example, that their veg F would probably shooting up pretty high would be kind of another indicator that something's going on. What do you think about that? Well, that's a great question. I, I'm not aware yet that we've actually studied levels, circulating levels of VEGF in people with COVID. And in fact, you've actually sparked a new research idea because we should be doing this, Sean. We will document on your podcast. This is where this idea began. And we'll have to acknowledge it if it turns out into a research, anything positive out of the research study. But I will tell you, um, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're still grappling with acute COVID infection, obviously. We're trying to get vaccinated so we can prevent um, getting the COVID. But the other problem that's occurring is long COVID or people who have you know, gotten the infection and they seem like they've gotten, their lungs have gotten better. But then months later, they wind up having all these same bizarre things all over again. Um, uh, head brain fog and smelling problems and racing heart, uh, all kinds of muscle skeletal weaknesses. And, and you know, we know that there's chronic inflammation. We know there's vascular damage. I've been studying that. And I'm wondering, maybe a biomarker for the damage actually would be high levels of circulating vegetable because inflammation, not only cancer, but inflammation also triggers VEGF to come out because usually, and you know, think about it, I, we started talking about VEGF as a good guy. It is. You needed to build all the muscles. You needed to build your heart. You needed to keep your circulation good. Um, but in the case of disease, the body responds and sometimes gets tricked and inflammation can cause a lot of VEGF to go out, which can also, um, you know, cause chaos. Good idea. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, you know what? I, I just thought of something else because in speaking about folks who come down with a severe case of this and then they're, you know, they recover and they're kind of trying to battle back. I know there's so many different things that people just aren't aware of that can assist in that. Because again, it's, we're talking about healing vessels, blood vessels. We're talking about healing capillaries. We're, this is where the real uh, kind of mess is taking place and the body's trying to fix. What do you think about something like hyperbaric oxygen, for example, to, to aid in that? You know, I, I, I've been thinking about this because I, I'm working with multiple groups now trying to figure out how to um, help people who have um, uh, survived COVID, but they're really struggling. And in some of the work I've done, uh, we've been able to document uh, literally people who are six, nine months out of COVID, they're missing blood vessels, sometimes up to 50 or even 80% of their microcirculation, those tiny little blood vessels in their lungs are missing, probably damaged by the, by the virus itself. And how do you grow them back? Well, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about is we need to heal up that injury caused by the virus, by COVID. And one of the things that we might be able to tear a page from the playbook of is wound healing. So hyperbaric oxygen is one of the tools that we use to be able to help people with chronic wounds that are not healing fast enough and they're at risk to really prompt them to stimulate new blood vessel growth. And guess what hyperbaric does? Hyperbaric oxygen um, stimulates VEGF. It stimulates the superhero growth factor, the protein that grows new blood vessels. So I'm going to score two for you because that's another <clears throat> way that might correlate with that um, that growth factor as a biomarker uh, in people who are actually trying to recover from long COVID if we actually get hyperbaric on them. When you put me in the study references, make sure to put that handsome guy for the Model Health Show, Sean Stevenson. Uh, well, listen, I think you should be a co-author on it. I'll make you Absolutely. read the manuscript. Absolutely. <laughs> So now I think it's a good point for us to dive in and share some of the things that you shared with me that was just like so eye-opening and refreshing. But proactively, what can we do? Because for me, and you, you know this about me as well, and you know everybody listening, one of my fundamental principles, one of the big tenets that I'm trying to integrate into our culture is the fact that our bodies are literally made from the food that we eat and also the ability to run processes. It's all dependent upon food. When we're talking about blood vessels, they're made 
from food. They're made from your food, the things you're consuming with you know, water, the oxygen you're breathing. It's creating the cells themselves. This stuff matters so much and it hasn't been a big part of the conversation. And we can just add some things in here, some health defense systems to be more on the offense. You know, and so you shared some things with me as far as food that was just so powerful. And let's talk about some of those right now. What are some of the foods that we can be targeting and eating and integrating to really to help us to build up some more resistance and resilience during this time right now? Well, listen, I mean, uh, I think that if our body's health defenses are strong, that old adage of the best offense is a strong defense is really the lead that we should be all thinking about, every single one of us, whether you get the vaccine or not, whether you've had COVID or not, whether you're just, you know, kind of going about your way, doesn't matter your belief system. You got to believe in yourself, regardless of your philosophy. Your body can never lie to you, which means that when you're actually, your body's not, when you don't believe in your body, by the way, like ultimately the biggest religion that we can have, all of us, is really believing in ourselves and what we're actually made out of. And so that core, our cellular integrity and our ability to be able to defend it is in fact, you know, what you were, I think you were talking about. So what are some of the things that we can do, uh, pandemic or not, but especially during a pandemic, that we can actually fortify our defenses? I'm gonna come to the, to the immune system at the very end but because we were just talking about some of the damage that can occur when you get COVID in the lung and damaging blood vessels, or even in long COVID, by the way, <clears throat> people with uh, who have survived COVID but having these damages, they call themselves long haulers, like truckers that are driving across the country. Man, you know, after 48 hours, still driving, still having this, still having this problem with COVID. Um, that's what they call themselves. Long COVID is what the British were calling this because they, you know. English people like to put t uh, uh, nice titles on things as much as possible. But the NIH recently created an official scientific and medical title for it. They call it PASC or PASC. Now, um, and that stands for post-acute, meaning after you've already had um, sequelae, meaning consequences of what you had to deal with afterwards, um, uh, COVID-19. So post-acute sequelae of COVID, PASC is basically what some of these people are having. And because I told you we just had vascular damage, let's start with what we can do to protect our blood vessels, right? Good circulation, you know, probably more resistant to virus infection, but definitely if it's been damaged, you want to be able to heal that baby up. So what are the things that can actually help us have a better health, uh, vascular uh, health defense system? You know, um, we know that fruits and vegetables are actually healthy for us. And by the way, I don't know if you saw this, uh, recently there was a, major um, study that came out, uh, looked at 2 million people and showed that exactly how many servings of fruits and vegetables you should have for optimal health. Turns out to be two servings of fruits per day and three servings of vegetables a day um, is actually what they just studied real world people and figured out that actually seems to optimize health. So what are, what are some things about fruits? You know, cause I, I actually really like fruits. Um, it turns out that there is a natural substance called ursolic acid and ursolic acid tends to be found in fruit peel, fruit skin. So when I, in the fall, when I actually eat fruit, um, uh, I, I love to eat the skin. It's got a lot of fiber in it, you know, extra nutrient, micronutrients. Um, and by the way, this is this would be the kind of the situation where I would tell people, if you're going to have the fruit skin, you probably want to have organic or organic-like grown because you don't want to have that pesticides on it. You can't scrub that off very easily. But ursolic acid actually stimulates, guess what, VEGF in your body to help grow blood vessels. So, you know, this is like a whole story we're telling in, in, in this podcast. Like every point actually connects to another point. And that's really what health is all about. Fruit skins. Now, listen, you want to eat some fruit skins. You can eat a whole apple and you can get a, you know, a fair amount of fruit skin. Um, but here's a, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, your, your, your viewers and listeners a super simple tip of how to eat a lot of fruit skin. Um, create a trail mix with good, healthy nuts, but have dried fruits in it dried cherries, um, uh, dried cranberries, dried blueberries, dried apricots. That's a way of shrinking down a pretty big mass of fruit into tiny little things. You can just pop, 
you can throw that down the hatch and get a lot of that fruit skin. So that would be one example of how we can do it. Barley is another example of a food that actually you know, it has this bioactive in it that actually stimulates angiogenesis. And mushrooms also have beta-D-glucan that can also help groom our vascular endothelium, those cells around our blood vessels to keep it healthy. Oh, that's perfect. So this is addressing one particular area, and it's incredibly insightful. And my son, Jordan, uh, you know, he's a personal trainer now. He's creating his own programs, helping people, working with kids. It's amazing. One of the things that he's always doing on social media is showing people the unique ways that you can eat fruit. So he's like eating the key, the whole kiwi, you know, which you would think just to peel off that kind of fuzzy skin. But, you know, this is another thing that you could take advantage of. Yeah, that's right. There's all kinds of little tips. You know, one of the things I love about food. So I always tell people I'm not one of these doctors that rejects modern medicine. Uh, and, and, I, and I somehow got on the, on the veggie craze, so I, wail, I stand up on a podium and wave, wave a kale leaf. I'm not one of those guys. Actually, I helped to develop biotech drugs, so I'm a big believer in the right medicine for the right person at the right time. Um, that's important, but the missing tool in the toolbox is our diet and our food. When it comes to food, I tell people I actually love food. I, don't, I wouldn't say I love eating. Like, I'm not, you know, I don't love stuff in my face, but I love food. I love food. Sean, because it tells us something. Everybody's got a connection to food. It's intimate. Food tells us something about our upbringing, how we grew up, what we remember, our earliest memories with our families, our moms, you know, our kitchens we grew up in, the smells when we were when we were coming back from school. It tells us something about our families, our communities, our culture. And so everybody has this very complicated, very personal, intimate connection with food. And that's the great thing about it is that you can always find, explore something new about how to eat foods. And if you're someone who's like me, curious about cultures, you know, um, you can go out and explore new cultures. It's like, you know, and in today's digital world, you can pick up a food that you don't know much about. Like, I'll give you one, bitter melon. The heck is a bitter melon? Well, it's a Southeast Asian. It's kind of like a cucumber. It's a little hairy. It's got grooves in it. Um, and if you were to eat it and taste it like, and you don't know how to prepare it, man, is that thing bitter. But if you want to actually skin it, seed it, chop it up, um, put it in some vegetable stock, slowly simmer to soften up the melon, okay, and then cook it with some fish or some chicken and that animal protein complements the bitterness and cooking it mellows the whole thing out, guess what that turn, turns out to do? It actually stimulates your stem cells, protects your DNA, and boosts your immunity at the same time. And guess what? Bitter melon has always been a traditional medicinal food in Southeast Asia. Like, man, I love that kind of stuff. And you can today, you can go on YouTube and search bitter melon recipe, and you can watch somebody cook it for you. Ah, uh, so good. Yeah, I haven't thought about bitter melon, bitter, bitter melon in quite some time. You know, that's one of those foods that also has some benefit with insulin resistance, for example. Exactly. You know, that's the thing too, is like, it, it's typically not just one thing that a food is good for because your body is not compartmentalized. It's good for, if it's good for one thing, it's probably good for a lot of other things. You said something to me the other day when we were talking about broccoli sprouts that really tripped me out. Can you share that? Yeah, well, so another immune system, uh, defense system uh, that we wanna boost these times is our immune system. And, uh, um, so one of the first things I did at the beginning of the pandemic was go back to my playbook to say, okay, so what can actually, um, uh, uh, amplify, amp up, um, that front line of defense, right? We're talking about those sentries, that passport control that can prevent viruses from coming in. Well, you know, here's what I did. I figured out, well, we didn't have a vaccine at the time, but I wanted to know what actually can naturally kind of not vaccinate yourself, but to up those or ramp up those natural defenses. And it turns out that sulforaphanes, which are a class of chemical that tastes a little sulfury, by the way, that's what kale, broccoli, cauliflower, they've got a lot of that sulfury um, kind of uh, a little taste to it, actually. It's kind of the, it's kind of the part of the palate, let's say, the palate stimulator. Um, that broccoli, actually adult broccoli, you know, the treetops and the, and the trunks, they have a lot of it. 
And I thought, you know, that's really cool because I had done research looking at the biological properties of broccoli, and, and we tested the, the treetops versus the, the stems, and we found the treetops are very active. We found that there was twice as much activity in the stem. So I thought, well, okay, well, let's, maybe I should be eating some broccoli stem. But then I started to take a look further, and I was blown away by something, Sean, which is that as much as broccoli stems have of these sulforaphanes, the, those are grown-up broccolis, that baby broccolis, broccoli sprouts, we're talking about three to four day old broccoli. You can see them in the markets now, like just a regular supermarket. If you go to the sprout section, I remember they used to have just only like bean sprouts. Now they got all kinds of sprouts, you know, alfalfa, broccoli. The broccoli sprouts are just growing up. They're three to four days old. You buy them up and you got to kind of peel them apart. They're, they're kind of like, like, it's like long, it's like turf, like astroturf a little bit. Peel them apart, wash them up and you eat them. They're, they, they don't taste like broccoli actually. They taste nutty, which I love. I love a little kind of nutty flavor. It's unexpected, honestly, and you can sprinkle on almost any food that you're actually preparing, and it, can, it makes it taste a little bit better. But here's the crazy thing. The, sulfur, the sulforaphanes that are in adult broccoli, the baby ones have 100 times the concentration. It's almost like the broccoli was born with all the sulforaphanes it's ever going to have. All right. And then and a little tiny little sprout. And as it grows up and extends in terms of this gigantic thing, Right, think Jolly Green Giant. Right, it's a big. It dis it distributes all the broccoli, the sulforaphanes that started in the in the entire body of the broccoli. So broccoli sprouts have a lot of sulforaphanes, and then here's the here's really the kind of the the punchline. Turns out research has been done showing that if you drink a shake made out of broccoli sprouts, a couple of shakes actually a day, and just a cup of broccoli sprouts put into a shake, um, and then you get actually a flu vaccine. So this isn't COVID. This is just regular old, you know, garden variety flu vaccine, which everybody should get. Um, and, and you also drink the broccoli sprout shake. You will, the shake, the broccoli sprouts will amplify, amp up your body's response to a vaccine 22 times so you wind up going kind of like ordinary vaccine responder to super soldier yourself you just like really amp your defenses and when they actually studied in these people these are these are young people healthy people um uh their t cells and, and natural killer cells they were amped up beyond and more more defense cells immune cells and more killing power within each of those cells against the virus. And then when they actually swabbed to look for viruses, right? Um, so, you know, like everybody was like, oh my God, not the COVID swab in your nose. But when you do research, you actually do swabs to just look for influenza, just a regular flu virus. We don't have to go deep, just go even in a regular nose. Uh, people who are on a placebo drink, so this is a placebo controlled study, um, still had flu, vaccine, flu virus in their nose, but in the broccoli drinkers, Shake drinkers who got the vaccine, zero, zed. And so this is sort of like the proof of concept of just how powerful Mother Nature is, and our body can respond to it in equally powerful ways. Incredible, incredible. All right, I know we're getting tight on time here, but I would love if you could share with these health defense systems, There's again, there's five that we need to target, and there's a lot more that you can learn from Dr. Lee, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if there's maybe one or two more foods that we need to target right now to help with our body's defense systems. Yeah, well, look, I mean, let, let's, let's go through five, okay? So angiogenesis, um, uh, we, we talked about fruit peel to help endothelial cells stay healthy. Uh, immune system, we talked about broccoli sprouts. Let's talk about regeneration, stem cells. It turns out that cacao, dark chocolate, the stuff, not the sweet stuff, the stuff that's actually kind of slightly bitter, comes from Mother Nature, comes from a pod, actually can double the number of stem cells in your bloodstream if you have the equivalent of dark chocolate, like 80% or higher. So it's pretty bitter. I, I actually like it. Um, and, you, and you have it as hot chocolate twice a day. Research has shown you can take people with cardiovascular disease, impaired blood flow, and you can drink that and it'll mobilize your stem cells. You can actually measure it with a blood test, right? Like the kind of blood test you go to your doctor's office. Instead of looking for the usual uh, suspects in a blood test you get, you look for stem cells, you can double the number of stem cells in your body by just drinking dark cocoa, 80% or higher, for 30 days. And, and, and then you double the 
the body's ability to healthier blood vessels because they've been repaired, regenerated. That's stem cells, all right? Now, that did that for your blood vessels. Think about what it did for your brain. Think about what it did for your heart. Think about it with your kidney, your liver, and by the way, your skin and your hair and all that other kind of stuff, important. So that's uh, the, the third defense system. Let's talk about microbiome, uh, something that people might not um, uh, have expected because, all right, look, I mean, you, you know, if I were to meet expectations, what am I going to say about the microbiome? Have some fermented foods. Go ahead and have some yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely do that. But what about kiwi? What have I told you? Because you talked about kiwi earlier. It made me think about it. Now, what have I told you that having you know, kiwi is a great source of vitamin C, which is good for your immunity um, and lowering inflammation, but it's got a lot of fiber in it and a surprising amount of fiber in just the green stuff. I'm, the, if you eat the skin, it's got a ton of fiber, but just the green stuff actually has a lot of fiber. Um, you can taste it when you're eating a kiwi. If you actually chew it, you can, you can, you can taste the fiber, although it kind of goes down really easily. Turns out, Eating just one kiwi a day will quickly start to change the number of healthy gut bacteria in your body. And, uh, and it only takes like 24 hours to cause that benefit. And so this is a quick, I wouldn't call it a fix, but it is a quick way of getting your gut to actually repair itself. And so um, microbiome, kiwi. Now let's go for DNA repair because I, you know, I, I, I love the idea of DNA, um, of fixing your DNA, your like own gene therapy. Here's uh, something that most people will take them like by surprise. There's a lot of things, you know, like antioxidants, do all that kind of stuff. What if I told you that sunflower seeds can actually slow down the degradation of your telomeres? So these are the life fuse, that thing that protects your DNA. Okay, that burns down slowly as we get older, and you want to slow that burn down, okay? Who wants to get older? You know, like, well, we do all want to get, we want to age great, and we want to make sure as we're aging, our DNA is not burning down too fast. What are things that happen as we age and our DNA gets shorter? Our hair starts to fall out, starts to turn gray, our skin gets wrinkly, our heart function gets less vibrant and and powerful as before, so we get, get tend towards heart failure. Our eyesight goes down, you know, our retina, you know, the neuroretina, which receives light, transmitted to our brain, starts to fade. What's the common denominator of aging in all of those cell types is our, our telomeres are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Remember that powder keg I was telling you about? When you get down to the powder keg, man, game over, right? You can't run away from that blast far enough. And so basically what you wanna do is slow that fuse down turns out that sunflower seeds can actually naturally slow down telomere degradation. And so that's another one. So five health defense systems. And I'm trying to see if I can remember this quickly. Angiogenesis, uh, a dried fruit, um, uh, 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 regeneration stem cells, dark chocolate, microbiome kiwi, DNA, uh, sunflower seeds, immunity, broccoli sprouts. Listen, I write about more than 200 different foods, but you know, like I was trying to bring up some stuff that most people might not have thought about uh, for this podcast. So many good ones, so many good ones. And also throwing in here some insights about bitter melon and veg F throughout the episode. So many incredible things. And Dr. Lee actually has a deep dive into all of these different health defense systems that people can get access to. And number one, this is something coming from a researcher, scientist like Dr. Lee, this is something to share with our friends and family, something to share with our parents right now, in particular our grandparents, who again, when we talk about this level of susceptibility, really, what are the things that we can do to address all five of those health defense systems? Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to up-level your health today. Somewhere around 70% of the United States population is on prescription drugs. Your liver is handling that shit. And also your liver is responsible for food, you know, food metabolism, that interaction as well. And your lip, the name, live, er. 